as we begin this morning, it's on my heart to tell you that I've lived long enough to realize that if the devil can, he will knock you out in one punch. But if he can't, and oftentimes that is the case, he will try to grind you down and weary you in the faith. And with everything going on in our world today, I just want to encourage you not to lose heart, to keep faith. Would you pray with me as we begin our study? Father God in heaven, hallowed be your name, and we pray and ask God that we can learn from the scripture we're about to study today, particularly, Father, from these individuals that your Holy Spirit, through the writer Luke, identifies as righteous, godly, people we should emulate. Father, help us to have the courage they did, in spite of circumstances, in spite of the way they were, might have been treated, marginalized, made f to be feeling less important. Help us, Father, to realize that you love us, and you do not judge as the world judges, but look at the heart. And Father, we pray that you'll look at our hearts today. And you'll see hearts that are full of love. You'll see hearts that are full of compassion and mercy and forgiveness. And you'll see hearts that above all else desire to please our God who made us. To walk in fellowship with you and your son Jesus and your Holy Spirit both now and forevermore. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Open your Bible to the Gospel of Luke, if you would. This morning's sermon is going to be uh, really an expository sermon of one passage, but we've got several other things we want to look at before we get there. As I begin reading the narrative portion, really the historical narrative portion of the Gospel of Luke that begins in verse 5 of chapter 1, I started to notice you know, the characters that the Bible is introducing us to. And it's emphasizing the kind of people they were. And a word that I have heard for years now to describe who we are is our legacy. And so I want to invite you this morning to consider the question that is on the screen. What kind of a legacy are we leaving? What kind of a legacy are we leaving behind? I'm about to give you a negative example. As I was thinking about an example that I could give as a legacy, I was reading through some of the preacher books and things that I have of illustrations, and I came across this one. Picture a man standing out in the middle of a grassy field, I guess you could call it, a polo shirt on, tucked into his khakis. And as he stands there, he's throwing a metal rod as far in front of him as he can. Now, I'm sure some of you at this point, you think, well, he's describing Rolf McDaniel and Alan Manning on Friday afternoons. But Rolf and Alan are my friends. I wouldn't talk about them that way, would I, Calvin? I just wouldn't do that. No, in fact, I'm talking about a professional golfer whose name was Tommy Bolt. And he was so known for his anger that he was given the nickname Thunder Bolt. And he was known for his just loud temper tantrums on the golf course. In fact, later on in life, he even went on to give examples, or I should say advice, on how to have appropriate temper tantrums on the golf course. <laughs> like, for example, he said, always throw the golf club ahead of you so you can pick it up on the way to the next hole. Okay. And then if you are a golfer in here, you'll understand this one. He said, never under any circumstance break your driver and your putter in the same round. And then he would go on to tell people, listen, I never threw a golf club that didn't deserve it. Now you and I can chuckle about something like that, right? We can, we can picture that. And, but that's this man's legacy. More than his skill on the golf course, more than his efforts and, and tournaments that he may have won. When people think of this man who passed away in 2008, they think of his temper tantrums, the fierce anger that he had when he played the games. And I think any mama or any grandmama in here would tell you that's not what they want their little boy to grow up to be. A man that's known for his fierce anger 
and his ability to throw a golf club when things don't go his way. And I use this as an illustration to make this point. It's important to think about the kind of legacy that we are leaving. Is that the kind of legacy that we want to leave? And if we're going to leave a godly legacy, what does that look like? Well, as we begin our study of the Gospel of Luke, we're going to be introduced to several characters. And we're going to be introduced to these people as a means of showing us the kind of heart that God desires. And I hope that's what you can get out of these first few characters that we meet. I hope that you will see in them the kind of person that God wants every single one of us to be. Because the Holy Spirit, through the writer Luke, is going to make value judgments on these people's lives. He's going to say, this is what I want you to observe about their lives. And so, in a real sense, this is a chance for us to do a checkup from the neck up. To look at our own lives and say, does my life reflect the same kind of godly qualities and character that these individuals that Luke is describing reflect? And so recorded in Scripture here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit are these characters that are going to give us a chance to reflect upon our own character. Why don't you read with me? It's a little bit of a lengthy reading, but it's important that we do so as we're looking at the text. Let's read verses 5 through 25 as we're introduced to Zacharias and Elizabeth. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of our Lord, of the Lord. And he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while he is yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the obedient to the attitude of the righteous. So as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked upon me with favor to take away my disgrace from among men. Before we look at the passage that I want to look at this morning, I want us to just think about what we're told here. We see a real clear example of how Luke is setting out to give us a historical account of the events in the gospel because of the way that we read verse 5. He establishes it in a very finite, very well-known historical period of time. 
He says it was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Now, this would have been Herod the Great. In the Bible, we read about two particular Herods, Herod the Great and then Herod Tetrarch or Herod Antipas. And Antipas. And each one of these men would have been basically a puppet king. And that is to say, they would have ruled and did the bidding of Rome over the region of Judea. And what we read about in Scripture and what history records about these individuals is that they were very, very wicked men. In fact, Herod the Great was very cruel and he was very uh, vindictive. And his son, Herod Antipas, would be ruler of Judea and he would oversee the crucifixion of Jesus or would be ruling at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus. You might remember in Matthew's Gospel account how Herod the Great was so insecure that when he felt his power threatened that he ordered the death of the baby boys in and around the region of Bethlehem. And God had actually to warn Joseph and Mary, and they fled to Egypt. And that was the kind of person that he is. What kind of a person does something like that? You know, a very cruel and a very vindictive individual. And yet this story, as Luke presents it, is not about Herod. In fact, Herod's not worthy of our consideration, is he? It's not this man of power. It's not this man of, a man of might, Herod, that Luke wants us to focus in on. Luke wants us to look at this older couple, not old, not elderly, but older, certainly past childbearing years. And, and in that day and age, even though they may have been and certainly were wonderful people, it would have caused people to look at them and say, what has happened in their life that God would not bless them with children? What has happened that they would not have an heir to their family? Because that was everything for them. You know, having children or not having a children was not a choice. It was something that everyone wanted because children were a blessing and children were an inheritance. And yet, we are told that Zacharias and Elizabeth were individuals who were not blessed with the child until Gabriel showed up and told them that in their old age, very much like Sarah, Abraham's wife, in her old age, Elizabeth was going to give birth to a son and he was going to be something special. In fact, next week, that's exactly who we're going to talk about is John the Baptist. But concerning Zechariah and Elizabeth, we learn that they're Levites, that they both descended from the tribe of Levi, and that Zacharias was of the eighth order of the priests. If you go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 24, if you want to write that passage down, you'll notice there that there was a very orderly way in which the priests served in the temple. And it was the time for Zacharias to go and serve. And so what he would have done is he would have went to Jerusalem and he would have served for a period of time. And as it happens, they cast lots and it was his responsibility to go into the temple and to make the offering. And so when he did this, he encounters this angel, Gabriel. And Gabriel tells them that Elizabeth is going to bear a child. Now, Zacharias, whatever the disposition of his heart was, it was not like Mary, as we will study later. Because Mary will ask a question about what she is told by Gabriel, just like Zacharias, but apparently he had some sort of doubting in his heart. Because the angel punishes him and says, listen, because you have done so, you will be mute until the fulfillment of these things. And then at the end of the reading that I read just a few moments ago, we see that as they go back to their town... Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And it wasn't until five months into her pregnancy that she even begins to tell people. And that's where we see Mary come into the picture, who was to give birth to Jesus. But that's for a later sermon. Something I want to mention before we look at the verse that I want to look at is, as I read through this, you see their character and their hardship. You see the character of these individuals, and yet you see that they were without child. In spite of their faithfulness, in spite of their diligence, life was not fair for them. And something that we're going to see throughout the Gospel of Luke, and I hope you are being diligent about your reading, something we're going to see is that our suffering and our hardship is not indicative of God's rejection of us. In fact, it's going to be some of the people that were suffering the most who are going to inherit the kingdom, that are going to listen to Jesus and become his followers. And in fact, what we see is that God's people, at least initially, and, and this challenges me, church, to be honest with you. It, 
at least initially when the church is established, when the kingdom is being taught, it's the people who were hurting, it's the people who were wounded that were a part of God's people. And if you listen to the kingdom passages in the Gospel of Luke, you would think that God's people are to be filled with the ranks of those who are hurting, coming to God in need of both physical and spiritual healing. And maybe the reason that sometimes we don't see that in the church today is related to the second thing that I want to make a point here. And that is, in the Gospel of Luke, if you were a sinner, God's kingdom has come to rescue you, not judge you. Let me repeat that. If you were a sinner in the Gospel of Luke, the way that the, the church, the way that the kingdom, what is later known as the church, but the kingdom passages are portrayed, is God has come to rescue you. Not to stand over you and wag the finger, but to rescue you from your sins. And so we'll pick up these themes as we study through the Gospel of Luke. But the passage that I want us to look at as we do really an expository approach to this passage, comes from Luke chapter 1 and verse 6. And so look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 6, because when you study your Bible, and as you're reading through your Gospel of Luke, one of the things that you need to pay attention to is when the Holy Spirit, through the inspired writer, makes a value judgment. So let me explain what a value judgment is. When, when the Inspired writer pauses in the midst of a narrative and says, now these things are characteristics. These uh, subject matters are things for you to pay attention to. And the first one we see in the Gospel of Luke is going to be this value judgment made on Zacharias and Elizabeth. And it's found in chapter 1 and verse 6. So let's read it again out loud here. The Bible says they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. And so if we break this verse down, I really see it breaking down easily into three points, which is good because some preacher said every good sermon has at least three points. And so the first point that we want to look at there is where it says they were both righteous before God. I want us to focus in on this word righteous for just a moment. What is righteousness? What does it mean to be righteous? You know, the Bible lists many examples of individuals that the scriptures tell us were righteous individuals before God. We could think about Job in Job chapter 1 and verse 1, and it says that he was right and just in the eyes of God. Or when I was reading in my Bible through my Bible reading recently, the story, uh, Bible reading plan that we're doing, and I came to Noah, it says that Noah was one who was righteous in the eyes of God. And therefore, he found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. But I had Vince read Genesis chapter 15 and those verses 5 and 6 because Abraham is particularly important for us to focus on. And I want to go back to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6 for just a moment. Because in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, it's going to talk about two ways that we need to understand righteousness. Here's what it says again from the New American Standard. And he, that is Abraham, believed in the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so what I want you to think about is the twofold approach to our understanding of righteousness that we get from Abraham. Number one, Abraham did what was right. Number two, Abraham was counted as righteous before God. And so I think I even put it in the sermon snippet there to draw a little picture. If that helps you to remember it, I think it's important to do whatever we can to remember this because if you think about an arrow on a swivel, right? So picture a stick, and there's a swivel right in the middle of that, and there's an arrow sign attached to it. And that arrow sign can point only two ways. It can point horizontally and vertically, and that's it. Horizontally and vertically. 
When we see the word righteousness appear, picture a screen behind that swivel, that sign there, and, and, and when the word righteousness appears in Scripture, what is it talking about? Is it talking about our own individual efforts, or is it talking about what God does to declare us as righteous? So if it's pointing horizontally when we approach a character in Scripture, then it's talking about our own actions which account for our righteousness. If it's pointing vertically in the Scriptures, we're talking about God's actions that account for our righteousness. And the reason Genesis 15 and verse 6 is quoted so many times in the New Testament, the reason it's important for you to memorize it and know it is because we see both there. Notice it again, and he, he believed Abraham. He did what God told him to do. He believed, and the Lord credited it as righteousness, counted him as righteous. Now, when we go back to Luke chapter 1 and verse 6, which way is the arrow pointing? If you want to know what aspect of righteousness is being identified here, which way is the arrow pointing? Is it not pointing at Zacharias and Elizabeth? And so the value judgment here is based upon what they did in order to be right in the eyes of God. And so this attribute of people who are walking faithfully with God, who are included as being righteous or said to be righteous, is going to be a theme that gets picked up throughout the Gospel of Luke. It's going to be said of their son, John the Baptist. It's going to be said of Simeon in the temple. And it's all going to point towards the kind of people that will inherit the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is going to be all about calling sinners to become righteous. And that's going to involve both parts of the process. There are things that we must do in order to be called righteous. And there's another part of righteousness in which God must declare us righteous because we cannot merit it or earn it on our own. But if we go on to the next thing that we see here regarding Zechariah and Elizabeth, it says that not only were they righteous, but it says that they were walking blamelessly. Walking blamelessly in the sight of God. What does it mean to have a blameless walk? What does that mean? Well, the word walking, when we see it in the scriptures, is akin to our English word for lifestyle. It's descriptive of the overall lifestyle of that individual. For example, I might say of an individual, he's an outdoorsman. Or I might say he's a family man. Does that mean that he's always outdoors because he's an outdoorsman? Or does that mean that he's, he doesn't have a job and the only thing he focuses in on is his family because he's a family man? No. You understand those things in our vernacular as indicating the lifestyle of that individual. An outdoorsman is someone who tends to enjoy doing the things that people typically do outdoors. And a family man is someone who typically enjoys spending his time around his family. I happen to be both, by the way. <laughs> I really like outdoor things, and I really like to spend time with my wonderful family. And so when we think about this word walking, it's talking about the lifestyle of that individual, the genuine, the genuine uh, demeanor of their life. So we're talking about a blameless lifestyle. And it's really not hard for any of us who you know, live in the real world, to, if we think about it, to pick up on what Luke is trying to emphasize about Zacharias and Elizabeth's life. None of us would see that and say that they are blameless in the sense that they are perfect, that they have done no wrong. Only when all things are considered regarding their character, we would see that they are above reproach. Like in speaking of an elder. No one, when we are looking for elders, is looking for a perfect man. But we are looking for someone who's walking a blameless life where you couldn't point to that person and say, you know... The way that he lives his life really speaks in such a way that he should not be an elder. Or if you are familiar with the job place of the workplace, speaking of someone as an upstanding or outstanding employee, they're not a perfect employee because no employee is, but they are their genuine their their demeanor is one that says they are blameless when all things are considered. But here's the point that I want to make between 
righteousness and walking blameless. In order to make a value judgment, there has to be something that they're compared against. And when we think about Zacharias and Elizabeth, okay, they're righteous. They are walking blamelessly before their God. What is it that the scriptures tell us in verse 6 that they are compared against? What is the measuring stick? Well, look at it one more time. Luke chapter 1 and verse 6 says, They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. So right there at the end, they are measured against their ability to walk in the requirements of the Lord. All the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And so we've, we get two things that we are introduced to here at the end of verse 6. One is simply called the commandments, and the other one is called the requirements or the statutes. Some translations will translate that word. And I want you to think about a line and a bucket. So the first thing that we see is the idea of a commandment. And if you're familiar with the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, then we understand what is being spoken about here. But when we think about a commandment, we should think about a line in the sand. So picture, if you would, a line that's drawn in the sand. And that commandment represents a line. And that line is not to be crossed using that proverbial illustration. Now go back to the idea of righteousness. Someone who is righteous is someone who, generally speaking, doesn't cross over that line. Or when they do cross over that line, they take the necessary steps to remedy that sin. It's what repentance is. But think about the walking blameless lifestyle. And I think this is really important for us to realize and think about. You know, would it be said of a blameless person? Does a, a lifestyle that is described as blameless, it, could it be described as a person who is constantly trying to see how close to that line they can get? I don't think so. I think a, a blameless lifestyle is someone that recognizes that there is a commandment there and constantly is focusing their life to try to stay away from that line because they know to cross that line is sin. But the other description that we have here is a righteous requirement that they were given. The righteous requirement of the law. And this expression is maybe a little harder for us to understand. But instead of thinking about a line in the sand with this point, I want us to think about a bucket that needs to be filled. So picture a line in the sand, first of all, and then second of all, picture a bucket. And that bucket needs to be completely full in order for the requirement to be met. If I said fill the bucket to one of my children and they came back and that bucket was half full, I would say, you didn't do what I asked you to do. Well, I put water in the bucket. That's not what I said. I said, fill the bucket. And fill means to the top. And so when we think about that term, the statutes or the righteous requirement, there's an expectation that God has of us that the bucket be full. And this is where we start to realize the need for Jesus, right? Right? Because how many of us can say, I never crossed the line? How many of us would say, my bucket is always full? Many of us realize there are times in our life where we have crossed the line. Many of us realize that even on our best days, our bucket is not completely full of righteousness. And the space between the righteousness in our bucket and the top of the bucket to be included as full is what the Bible calls Grace, that vertical arrow pointing up, right? Where God gives us what we lack. And how does he do that? Well, he does that because of Jesus. Because of what Jesus did for us. That's how God can look at Mike and say, his bucket's full, and the devil can say, no. -uh. <laughs> and God can say, well, not full of his own goodness. He's doing the best he can. But where he's lacking, I have given him grace through my son, Jesus. And so when it says this of Zacharias and Elizabeth, that they were walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, it means that they were doing the best that they could 
to not cross that line. They were doing the best that they could to do their part in filling up the bucket, while like all of the other people of faith throughout history, trusting in God to do what they lack. I want to deviate for just a second right here at this point, because quite frankly, I believe we struggle with this. This is a point of emphasis in this sermon, because I think that many Christians struggle with understanding this idea of righteousness and blamelessness. On the one hand, I think we struggle with self-righteousness. I think some struggle with self-righteousness. And what I mean by that is some struggle feeling that our own goodness is good enough. Or we will judge ourselves based on flawed standards. In other words, I'm judging myself based on what I see in the world or on other people in the world or maybe even other people in the church. You realize that none of us know our, our own measure of righteousness is never in Scripture described as compared to other people. What was the standard of righteousness that Zacharias and Elizabeth were given here in this passage? Wasn't it the commandments and the statutes that God had given? That was the standard that they were measured against. And so when we go about with this self-righteous way, and we look at one another and we judge one another in that way, well, at least I'm not like that guy, you know, or at least I'm not like this lady. We judge ourselves with a flawed standard like that publican that Jesus spoke about that was standing there praying and saying, I'm so grateful I'm not like this tax collector. I pay my dues. I show up to church. I do the right thing. Meanwhile, the tax collector standing back there beating his chest and going, God forgive me, I'm a sinner. And Jesus tells us specifically that it was the tax collector that went away righteous. And so we struggle sometimes with this idea of self-righteousness. And when we do that, we distort the meaning of grace. Because if I, if, if I can make my bucket be full... If my lifestyle is such that I've never crossed the line, then I don't need grace, do I? And when we live in a self-righteous way, we live in a way that, quite frankly, indicates we don't need Jesus. And it produces within us a self-righteous attitude. But on the other hand, we struggle with this when we diminish the importance of our own efforts. And I really need to emphasize this point because we live in a day and time in which people want to diminish that last part of verse 6, the commandments and the righteous requirements of the Lord. They want to say those things aren't as important anymore because we live under a system of grace and not a, under a system of law. But the point that is being made here is the horizontal aspect of righteousness. That it is our responsibility as much as we can to do everything that we can to be righteous in God's eyes. Knowing that we're going to fail and when we lack, there is grace for people who are trying. And that's the kind of people that Zacharias and Elizabeth were. And when we diminish our own efforts or when we diminish how important our own efforts are, sometimes we fail to forgive ourselves. We, we fail to accept forgiveness. We fail to offer forgiveness to other people. Then, or we may lower the standards. You know, God's commands and His righteous requirements may be up here, but because we diminish our own efforts, we lower the standard. Or we, we make grace this blanket for our sin, like the people in Romans 6 were. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Grace does not give us a blanket order to just sin as often as we want because there's this unending bucket of grace. Grace is for those that are trying the best they can to be righteous in, in all of the statutes and the commandments of the Lord like Zacharias and Elizabeth were. And so that brings me down to my one big application. We said we we're going to look at you know, one big application each sermon, and here's the one from this sermon. As Christians, going back to the top here, as Christians, we need to forge a legacy that's built on righteousness. And one of the things that I've tried to do, I don't know how successful I was, but I've tried to help us have a biblical understanding of righteousness. And I've tried to expose some of the faulty thinking that we sometimes have about righteousness. 
that it is actually possible for me to be self-righteous, which it's not. Nor is it possible or, or nor is it acceptable for me to diminish my own efforts, to lower the standard, to live in sin because I feel like grace is just this unending amount that God is going to give me regardless of how I choose to live. What we see in Luke chapter 1, 5 and following is a couple that was not chosen by God because of their worldly status. It wasn't because they were the richest or they were the most powerful or they were the famous, most famous. In fact, I think it's worth noting that it is because they were marginalized yet faithful and righteous that I believe God chose them. I believe that. They lived in the margins of society because of what had happened to them, and yet they're the ones that God chooses. And they were chosen in spite of their worldly status because of their righteousness before God. And so I want to throw two scriptures out there as we close. One comes from 1 John chapter 2, 3 and 4. And we have to tell ourselves the truth about this business of righteousness. John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. Same word as in Luke 1 and verse 6. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. And so when we are asking ourselves, what is our responsibility in this process of becoming righteous, it is to know and keep the commandments of the Lord. And that's why we emphasize studying the Bible. That's why it's important to, to listen to the sermon and to come to church and to study our Bibles because you're not going to know what you don't know. And we must know these things so that we can do our part, knowing that God is going to do His part. But there's a passage later on in the Gospel of Luke that I want to lastly look at, and it comes from Luke chapter 12, 54 and 57. Jesus is saying to the people there, to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it turns out so. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say it will be a hot day, and it turns out that way. You hypocrites. You know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is righteous? Same word as in Luke chapter 1 verse 6. Why don't you judge what is right? Boy, Jesus doesn't mince any words, does he? You know, in essence, Jesus tells us there, look, you know how to tell the weather but you're telling me you can't tell the difference between righteousness and wickedness? He says, judge for yourselves on your own initiative. Take the initiative to know what is right and then go be right. So we're given this example of Zacharias and Elizabeth. These righteous individuals, humble servants of the Lord that God is going to look, work through. And next week we're going to be looking at their son, John the Baptist, who gives us another great example in scriptures of someone to look to. As we close out this sermon, though, I'd like to ask you to bow your head in prayer with me. Father in heaven, you alone are perfectly holy and full of righteousness. Fill us with your desire to trust in your power to declare us righteous. And leave no room in our hearts to declare ourselves good. Father, forgive us for being judges with evil motives at times. Help us to honor those with humble and obedient hearts, just as you do. Let the world see in us not a righteousness that is derived from worldly measures of goodness, but a people fully trusting in the cross of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so as we extend the invitation this morning, it is not possible for us to be right with God. I hope you've 
seen that in this lesson. It is not possible for us to be right with God without obedience. Nor can anyone come to Him except by faith. Remember the example of Abraham. Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him as righteous righteousness. It's like the song that, I just love the song that goes along with this lesson, trust and obey, for there's no other way. And we know that if we ask anything in Jesus' name, He hears us. And so this morning, the invitation is for us to consider that example of righteousness and to hold ourselves up, to see if we are walking in all the commandments and righteous requirements of the Lord, just as Zacharias and Elizabeth were. And if we're not, to take those necessary steps in order to fix that. We call that repentance. And to know that we have a God who loves us and is full of grace and mercy. And He's given us this great avenue of prayer that we could come to Him in Jesus' name. And so this morning, if you would like to find out how to become a Christian, to repent of some sin publicly, or if you'd like this congregation to pray with you, we extend the invitation. Won't you come as we stand and sing? Marvelous grace of our loving Lord.